there's a survey of American freshmen that's been taken every year since 1970. Almost 100,000 18-year-olds across the country. And we can see that in 1970, uh, women, 18-year-old women were a bit more conservative than 18-year-old uh, boys. By about 2004, the women start to pull away and start to become more liberal, but it's not a big difference. But by 2016, 17, thereabouts, it's up to like 14 points. The women are 14 points more liberal. The young men are basically the same as they were. Some surveys show them a bit more conservative, but but no, nothing dramatic. It's really the, the women have really moved quite far in the leftward direction. Welcome to another episode of Counterculture, the show that stands at the intersection of reason and faith in the battle against sentimentality. Queer people have magic. Hey, look, I think every individual should be confident and believe they have the power to make things happen. However, the point of that phrase in that ad for a line of clothing at Walmart is not the expression of self-confidence. It's Pride Month politics. Walmart knows its audience, and it's what our guests on this episode would call bleeding heart liberals. These are the people who play the solidarity and marginality game, neatly dumping people into one of two buckets, the magical mascots for whom they are the protectors versus the evil oppressors. It's a predatory majority pretending to be an aggrieved minority, and they show no sign of slowing their rapaciousness because why would they mess with the success? But, it, it, but is there a reaction to the oppression by the faux oppressed? Perhaps a revolution of the proletariat, as one outlet recently termed it, building off the frat bros who defended the flag against the model Hamas protesters on the University of North Carolina's campus. What, in fact, are the ideological trend lines in American politics, and what do they portend for November and beyond? To help us get a clearer picture of the political landscape, we're pleased to be joined by Eric Kaufman. Kaufman is a professor of politics at the University of Buckingham and the author of the new book, The Third Awakening, A 12-Point Plan for Rolling Back Progressive Extremism. Professor Kaufman, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Great to be here, Dan. So um, I, I, I want to start with where uh, young people are at right now, uh, particularly against uh, the backdrop of all of the consternation and um, quite a bit of ugliness on college campuses over the last several weeks, uh, really over the last several months since the October 7th terrorist attack in Gaza. Um, and what we find what we, the perception is that there's, divi there's this divide starting in high school in terms of political attitudes between uh, boys and girls, and, and then it, and it grows in college. But what you suggest uh, from the writings I've read is that girls are moving left, and, but boys aren't really moving that far right. So g give us sort of your uh, handle on, on the landscape. Well, yeah, I mean, just in terms of the data, for example, uh, you know, there's a survey of American freshmen that's been taken every year since 1970, almost 100,000 18-year-olds across the country. And we can see that in 1970, uh, women, 18-year-old women were a bit more conservative than 18-year-old uh, boys. By about 2004, the women start to pull away and start to become more liberal, but it's not a big difference. But by 2016, 17, thereabouts, it's up to like 14 points. The women are 14 points more liberal. The young men are basically the same as they were. Some surveys show them a bit more conservative, but but no, nothing dramatic. It's really the, the women have really moved quite far in the leftward direction particularly on the cultural issues. Um, but it's worth saying also that depending on the question, so that's in terms of liberal conservative, but actually if we get into questions around culture war issues, actually both men and women have moved to the left. It's just that women have moved far, far more than men. Now, and that's another reason by the way, so if we take, we can take any question, you may have seen uh, the question on do you, who do you feel more sympathy towards Hamas or Israel and a forced right. choice question. And it splits about 50-50 amongst the 18 to 24. As anyone over 45, it's almost zero for Hamas. That's kind of giving you a sense of just how big this youth quake is. And why? One of, one of the arguments that I make in the book is the idea that we've hit peak woke and it's going to go away 
uh, a bit like McCarthyism suddenly went away in 1953. It's really fanciful. The, this is uh, very much marks a continuation and not an aberration uh, of the culture. Right. I mean, actually, you saw this um, recently with um, uh, in Philadelphia. There was a, a gay pride parade, and then there were also these pro Hamas protesters, and they sort of met in the middle of the street and were arguing for supremacy on the street, like who who should be getting the most attention right now. So you know, one of these sort of you know what one of what, what what we like on the what conservatives like me like to say, oh, this is the 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 identitarian left cannibalizing itself, but it's not really. Uh, it's actually there's sort of a coming together. And even though especially gays supporting Hamas is is just wildly oxymoronic, um, it's happening anyway. And and it, it, I go back to that solidarity and marginality piece that sort of provides the linchpin to all of it, doesn't it? Yeah, you're right. And so if you've got a common enemy, then the glaring contradictions in your movement uh, won't see the light of day. So you can get queers for Palestine because you don't look too closely into the <laughs> the problems with that that you know Hamas Muslims c c conservative Muslims have with homosexuality. Um, but, but yeah, and so what is underneath this, and one of the points I make in the book is that we really have to look at the bleeding heart liberals, not, I mean, there's the cultural Marxist agitator revolutionary types, uh, but they're not the main, you know, if, they, if, it was, if it was just about them, we wouldn't have a problem. We wouldn't have, you know, the young population split evenly between Hamas in Israel, or between, incidentally, dropping J.K. Rowling, asking her publisher to drop her or not to drop her, it, that's also split 50-50. Uh, Two-thirds in surveys I've done approve of Google firing James Damore, the programmer who questioned the firm's feminist uh, uh, ideas around promoting women in, in programming. All of these areas where really young people are really off the scale in terms of these cultural issues, where does this come from? I'm arguing this is not really an offshoot of Marxism for most of them. For most of them, it is this idea of be kind. But what, of course, be kind means is, is be kind to certain groups and unkind to other groups. You be kind to the person who wants to transition from a woman to a man, pretty unkind to the person who may who says, oh my God, I want to detransition. I wish somebody had advised me properly and now I've got all this damage to my body. Uh, not much kindness towards that individual. So it's very selective uh, who they're kind towards. But the bottom line is it's this idea of uh, minorities, good, majority, bad. Uh, it's guilt and it's compassion towards certain empathetic groups, uh, you know, race, gender, sexuality, and it's hostility towards white, male, straight, that kind of thing. So right. it's a very simple set of impulses that the young population has imbibed. But my, I would argue that actually was already there even when I was coming, when I was in university in the early 90s, for example, that would be a time when this was already happening. We had political correctness. So these ideas have been there. It's just that it's metastasized and it's become even more extreme. Uh, but this is not something that is, is, is new. It's not this idea that, oh, we had a sudden deviation because of smartphones and social media in the mid 2010s. No. Yes, that sort of oxygenated it. But the reality is that these ideas were already there. And what we've just seen is an intensification of them. And so this is really the way, this is kind of the moral universe that these young people are operating in. Well, right. And, and, and they, they've learned, everybody's learned how to play their role, right? Because, because there's benefits to be conferred, to, to be garnered. So, so the way I describe it, I mean, it's sort of in Marxist terms. So the vanguard, those bleeding liberals that you're talking about, they, they get sort of the feeling of being a good person, being the, the hero in the story, uh, protecting these downtrodden, even when the downtrodden are not so downtrodden, but the downtrodden play the victim card because they know there are benefits to be had and you're going to be celebrated and you're going to be protected and you're going to get a sinecure or a deal or, or what have you, an opportunity that you wouldn't have otherwise got if you weren't playing the victim. But I mean, you, you can say gays are, for example, like LGBTQIA two spear plus 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 that whole. Thing. You can say you can say that they're they're a minority, and because in numbers they are, but in terms of culture, I mean the the majority is overwhelming. I mean, how much more 
do you need to be seen and celebrated and overrepresented in media and 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 corporate America and so on and so forth before you stop being some you know insular minority that uh, is being marginalized by this uh, fictional majority? Well, yeah, exactly. So in terms of cultural power, these minority groups are punching way above their weight, as you just said. And actually, what is the origin of this? I mean, that's, again, something I trace in my book. I argue that the uh, anti-racism taboo, which emerges suddenly in the mid-60s, is like the Big Bang of our moral universe. You know, the Big Bang is the origin of our universe. Everything's been expanding outward because of that. Similarly, our moral order was created with that mid-1960s Big Bang. Now, I mean, I think many of us would say it was good to have a norm against racism, but to make it sacred. I mean, that's the key, is that this is a bit of kryptonite and sacredness around a group that you've created. It's not just questioning racism. It's now, this is a group that's sacred. Shelby Steele in his book, White Guilt, talks about this, how now all of a sudden it used to be that white, you know, black Americans would defer to white Americans. And now it's the opposite where, and he's black himself, he lived through these changes. And he says, now you could see white guilt on people's faces. And it's whites who have to defer to blacks who have the cultural power, because once you admit to doing wrong to a group, you give away cultural power. To some degree, it had to happen, but it's also the origin of our moral order. And in fact, that anti-racism taboo becomes like the sun around which this moral universe revolves. Now, once you've got that, that sacredness and that taboo around racism, you can then stretch this thing to uh, sex, to, to gender, and, and you can sort of expand it outward to cover not just calling somebody the N-word, but mispronouncing their name, or, or even saying something like, you know, anyone can make it in America, that becomes a microaggression, that's racist. So the meaning of racism is becoming inflated out of all proportion and weaponized, uh, yeah, to shut down any idea. You want to talk about immigration, you want to talk about crime, you want to talk about education, all of those things, all those conversations are shut down if there's any kind of disparity by race. And so, yeah, I think this is, uh, it all grows out, I argue, of this taboo, which has no bounds on it. The sacredness just expanding all the time and each generation pushing it further and further. So until we actually get a handle on this taboo and sort of make it into a, a norm like any other, a norm against class prejudice, against prejudice on the basis of height or of religion or of anything else, that's it needs to be kind of reduced in terms of its power, because right now it's just some kryptonite that anyone gets a hold of. So the left, what happened is the whites whites lost cultural power to African Americans, but then the left also went, leaned into that so that they could gain cultural leverage against the right. And, and that's been the genius really of the left is weaponizing that taboo. Well, and you 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 talk to that that phrase or that word sacred too. That's key because it also perhaps uh, in part explains some other data that um, I, uh, I I consume from your research, which shows how increasingly intolerant, particularly women on campus are, but generally increasingly intolerant uh, women are of uh, free speech. So. This is where, yeah, obviously we've seen the the, the high profile protests and 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 conservative speakers being, you know, kicked off campus or or the event being canceled. But also just in general, and just in general, in in, in uh, you know the inability to hear a cross word, a, a an opinion different than yours, and and it it bears out in your survey research. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I'll take one number for you from the. Um... The Foundation for Individual Rights and Expressions annual campus survey, 55,000 students in the top, a couple of hundred institutions. Uh, if you, you know, if you look at uh, female students who are not Trump voters and ask them if they would date a Trump voter, it's only 7%. Uh, amongst male female students, it's 19%, still pretty small, who would date a, a, a Trump supporter. So, I mean, we're talking about, and, and survey after survey now shows that the left and liberals, especially young people, are just a lot less tolerant of the other side than young conservatives are. Uh, and it's worse amongst women. Now, there is a difference. So, younger women are, for example, very intolerant of a speaker who might say BLM is a hate group or transgenderism is a mental disorder. Uh, or, or abortion should be banned, but they, they would tend to be 
you know, women tend to be much more likely to want a no platform and keep offensive ideas off campus than men. Uh, however, there are certain questions such as would you should is it OK to use violence to stop a speaker you don't like where men are more likely to agree to that than women or, or blocking a speaker? So it depends on the question, but women seem to go very heavily for this kind of protective ethos of it's more important to have harmony and protection um, than to have free speech, whereas some of the sort of far left men are more involved in the kind of violent aspect, the Antifa, that kind of uh, aggression is, is stronger amongst the sort of male far left. Well, right. And so, I mean, and, it, and again, the hilarity ensues if this were a funny topic, because the only reason they can take that posture is because they're the dominant majority on campus and in most of these other places where they have, uh, you know, effective control of the institution. So they're imposing their will and they're and they're eliminating dissent, you know, in a compulsory fashion. At the same time, they're, you know, decrying the oppression of those people they claim to represent. Well, yeah, I mean, so only, you know, over well over 80 percent of uh, Biden supporters uh, within the faculty feel free to express that view to a colleague and fewer than 20 percent of Trump supporters on the faculty. There are a few, not many, maybe five percent, but uh, fewer than 20 percent feel comfortable doing that. And that shows you the difference. 20 versus, you know, between 80 and 90. Who has the power on campus? I mean, part of what the book also, however, says is, you know, you've got these sort of cultural Marxist agitators, but they would get nowhere without this big chunk of support. You know, in the university faculty, 50 to 60 percent of the academics uh, would fall into this category. They don't favor firing uh, academic researchers for uh, politically incorrect research, uh, but they would favor diversity statements. You know, by two to one, um, faculty, you know, on the left favor diversity statements, right? So that's an example where mandatory diversity statements, they're all in on, but they don't favor cancellation. You've got this middling group who are very susceptible to any kind of appeal on the basis of vulnerability, minorities being vulnerable, uh, you know, inclusion, we need more diversity, we need more equity. That kind of packaging, it sounds nice and they will always go for it. Um, well, well, they're that's enablers. the reason that these, sorry? They're enablers, basically. I mean, uh, they're, they're just, they're taking a, you know, they're just like rounding off the edges of the cultural Marxists because, you know, they're, they're what I would call sentimental barbarians. And so and so this is this is the way they do it. As it's, you know, this is like the be kind kind of thing. Um, right. It, it, which is, you know, Orwellian um, and and and, um, and 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 of course, necessarily cruelty ensues. But it also they also, it seems to me, feel particular uh, possibly comfortable in that role. One, because the the cultural Marxists do the dirty work um, and and and. Two, they're afraid of them, and three, uh, they don't have to worry about conservatives. You know that that's the whole thing. They it, it, and it's generally now in the West is like we can ignore conservatives. We can exist without them. We don't have to encounter them. We can push them out of all of these spaces and in these institutions, and they can't do that to us. Well, yeah, because you know, right now in the, on the faculty, for example, in the social sciences and humanities and leading universities. We're at about a 15 to 1 left to right ratio or, or Democrat to Republican ratio. Now, increasingly, a lot of the professions, particularly the cultural ones, teaching, but also law, also medicine are moving in the same. And not only have they got the numbers, I, you could even have an institution like the police or the military where they may not have the numbers, but our public morality, you know, the terrain is so slanted because you know, it's such a force multiplier to be able to plug into those taboos. So even if everyone's largely conservative, if you wave the LGBTQ flag or you talk about inclusion or diversity or equity, very few people are going to know how to respond and they're going to be scared of being accused of racism or homophobia or, or, or sexism, for example. And because that's the nature of our taboos. And so, I'm, you know, even a small minority can leverage this terrain to tremendous effect. Um, and that's part of the problem that we have even in the wider society. You even look at, you can even look at uh, the Republican Party might 
you know, for a long time was scared to talk about affirmative action, even within Republican circles. And that shows you the power of these of, of this moral order uh, and in, in sort of setting the, the table, the terrain within which you've got to operate. And it just gives a huge advantage to the cultural left. Oh, I mean, we, we, we saw it uh, again recently now that we're, you know, in full uh, Pride Month uh, activities. The FBI is marching with, uh, you know, the LGBTQ in West Hollywood. Uh, that same FBI that, you know, raided the home of a, a, pro, a, a peaceful pro-life, you know, prayer warrior in rural Pennsylvania. Um, uh, had, had they raided the home of some LBGTQ plus activist that was uh, protesting outside a Catholic church or a crisis pregnancy center, then, I mean, th there would have been a firestorm around the FBI. But you target Catholics or you target a pro-lifer in rural Pennsylvania and, you know, you've got media cover and and people who are similarly disposed in terms of philosophy or belief system basically say that's terrible what happened. What can we do about it? Well, yeah, because the the, the wider question here is is one of left left liberalism is really the dominant ideology in elite institutions across the West. and. This is really, it really comes down to a couple of things. One is uh, a, a sort of alarmist, catastrophizing moral panic around majorities that, that, that give them half the chance and they'll drag us back into the Jim Crow South or Germany 1933, you know, women back in the home. There's that kind of exaggerated uh, moral catastrophism. Uh, that combined with this guilt and compassion around uh, historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual minority groups who've been made sacred. That's the definition of woke, is the making sacred of these groups, actually, the one sentence definition. Um, and so that is the way they look at the world. Um, and so if they see um, protest from the right, that's scary and tantamount to some kind of revolution uh, that'll bring us back to Germany 1933. If they see protest from the left, it's like, well, virtuous. OK, they went a little far. Maybe they burned down some buildings and attacked some police. But, you know, that's OK. It's not serious. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to just sort of uh, set the table to going back to your book, The Third Awakening, the third. Uh, what were the first two? Well, so the first uh, awakening is, is really the late 60s. The second is the late 80s, early 90s. And the third is post 2015 or thereabouts. So in each case, what we have is this uh, left liberal idea uh, on the cultural side, um, having a sort of spasm of a kind of moral panic or outrage. So the late 60s, you had the student occupations, for example, Black Panthers armed to the teeth with rifles uh, entering and occupying a Cornell building or elsewhere, you know, San Francisco State demanding 50 black studies, uh, 50 black professor, professoriates, uh, or, sorry, professorships, um, black studies program. Uh, you had demands for, uh, you know, allowing criminals back out of jails from the Black Panthers. That's sort of the late 60s first awakening of these left liberal ideas. Again, with the central focus around race and later um, feminism and, and, and the gay rights movement. That was the late 60s. And then we get into late 80s, early 90s, political correctness, speech codes, Afrocentrism, multiculturalism. These are the, the buzzwords of that second wave. And then I'm, I'm drawing a connection between those first two waves and what we see in the third wave with cancel culture, critical race theory, gender ideology, all these sorts of things. They're all based really around the holy trinity of identity groups, of sacred groups, uh, race, gender, and sexuality. Um, and it's similar ideas. It's all around equal outcomes and emotional harm protection. So any race or gender gap is proof of white supremacy or sexism. Um, any uh, speech which offends a group uh, must be shut down and censored. So polit political correctness was the term in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and the idea was minority self-esteem. We're now into uh, tr you know, emotional trauma, emotional safety as a result of um, you know, these minorities feeling unsafe, quote unquote, uh, to have a speaker who is gender critical or a speaker who's critical of immigration on campus makes somebody feel 
traumatized or unsafe. It's the same language and it's the same principle, which is uh, equal outcomes, emotional harm protection. That is really what this dominant ideology is. So when people say, oh, we've passed peak woke or this is a new thing, my argument is no, this is a continuation of our dominant ideology. And that's why this dominant ideology is going to continue into the future. I think it's going to get worse as these young people become the median voter and the median employee and become leaders and gain power in our society until we turn this around uh, and we start to change the way our young people are socialized. We're only going to get in deeper and deeper into this. Well, see, that's that's my sense of it, too. But a lot of people and I understand why they do it, because they want to be hopeful and and because um, these people are doing good work and making good sense. But they look at Riley Gaines and they say, well, you know, this we're, we're going to turn the tide on this. And this 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 men playing women's sports is not going to last. And look at the work Riley Gaines and others are doing and and, and detransitioners who are speaking out and so forth. Um, and I don't think so. Um, look at uh, I, I mentioned, look at the the, the re revolution of the proletariat. you know, from Nick Sandman, you draw a line to the guys on the campus of North Carolina who protected the flag. But what I see are one offs. What I see, maybe this is too extreme to say death rows, but I see people that are, are well intended, that are fighting the good fight on principle. But um, there's a lot of people that don't realize that they are still losing the fight. Maybe they're slowing the pace of the loss, but they're losing it nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to to go back, you know, 1991 on the McNeil Lehrer News Hour, uh, Robert McNeil had Dinesh D'Souza on there and said, well, look, you know, this, this was 1990, I think, the interview. Um, this political correctness thing, you know, it's flamed out, it, people are making fun of it, and it's gonna, it's, it's gonna be gone. So we don't even have to worry about that. And D'Souza sort of said something interesting. He says, well, this isn't just a few radical students. This is the academic establishment. And that means that it's going to be with us. And he, he ultimately has been proven to be right, because what happened was it became institutionalized in speech codes uh, and, and in, in affirmative action. Um, and likewise, I think what we have is a sort of, you know, we've got the peak of the wavelet that's come down but there's still a, wide, a rising swell behind it. Whereas if you take uh, uh, McCarthyism, you know, in 1953, when there was that sort of, have you no decency, sir, or, or even the witch hunts, the Salem witch hunts in the 1600s, you know, the social energy behind this thing, the direction of the ideology was really in decline. The direction of anti-communism of the McCarthyite type was really on its way out when that phrase, have you no decency, sir, came in, and that was the end of the McCarthyist witch hunt. But what, what we have now is actually something that's actually quite the reverse. We may have seen the peak of the energy, and there's a bit of rolling back of DEI, and the odd university, Harvard, now says they're going to get rid of diversity statements. Okay, fine, we have a few little victories because we've had that peak of energy. Uh, but actually coming in behind is all of this uh, is this new generation that has been steeped in this, which is one of the reason I, I argue in the book that, you know, reform of the public education system has to be a central part of conservative politics going forward. Uh, otherwise, conservatism has no future, and they have to find a way to stop the indoctrination in schools, which, but, which does, by the way, really work. Um, and that was the finding of a, of a piece of work that Zach Goldberg and I did at the Manhattan Institute about a year ago, looking at a survey of 18 to 20 year olds and, and what they had been taught in terms of radical race and gender ideology. That really did affect their views in a serious way. So does that mean in your, in your uh, estimation um, at the K through 12 level, uh, more choice programs or is, do we have a, a supply problem? Uh, more choice programs, but you need more choices for those choice programs too. It's schools that are going to teach the classical, classical small L liberal curriculum and, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think school choice is a good thing, but it's not going to really be the solution. It's a bit like I use the example of Parlor Gab and Truth Social. Uh, they didn't really solve the free speech problem on social media. It was Elon Musk taking over Twitter that really made the impact. Uh, and similarly, I think there's going to have to be some takeover and reorientation of the public system because most kids are going through that system. And even the ones going through the private system, the data we have suggests they're getting as much critical race and gender theory as the kids are in the public system. I mean, if you think of the universities, for example, 
there's school choice when it comes to universities. You can choose which university you go to, but you're going to get pretty much anywhere you go the same message. And I think that's my worry is a lot of conservatives like to have this idea as, oh, well, we'll just have school choice and somehow that'll solve the indoctrination problem. I really don't think it will until you get, you have to do both and. You've got to get at the education, uh, the schools of education and universities, the materials that are online. You have to also allow school choice, but really you have to sort of get serious the way Ron DeSantis has, for example, about what's in the curriculum and saying, no, you're not going to teach, uh, you're not going to indoctrinate, you're not going to teach critical race, radical gender ideology uh, the way you've been doing. And if you try that, then you're going to be in deep trouble. I think, unfortunately, that's the only real way to begin to change this, because by the time these young people set foot on the campus, we know their views are largely crystallized now. Um, so the universities, at least in terms of young people, I don't think make much difference, but the schools I think really do. And I wish conservative politicians would spend much more time and have much more stamina to take on the education establishment compared to shorter term issues around the economy and foreign policy, which may grab the headlines, but in terms of the future of the civilization, it's really coming down to education and culture. Yeah, I know you've got the, the 12 point plan in your book, but yeah. but it, but essentially you're suggesting the executive leadership you're getting from uh, like a Ron DeSantis in Florida, both at the K through 12 and collegiate level uh, surround, you know, central uh, is the curriculum fights. And, and he's he's taken all the hits and and he became a national lightning rod. And of course, he's mischaracterized in the character assassination and all that. Don't say gay and all that stuff. Um, but 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 that's the model. That's the model you got to replicate. You got to win governorship. You got to win elections in in state legislatures and general assemblies. And you got to move policy at the state and local level. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Absolutely. And and this is where I'm, I always get a bit worried when I hear too much talk about, oh, well, we'll just cut budgets and have school choice. That's not going to do it. You're going to have to get into the weeds of the content of what's being taught and to try and set a curriculum that sort of removes that, that leads to political neutrality and balance and get the indoctrination uh, out of the system. Now, in terms of the politics of this, there's a couple other things I would add. One is it's we know that from from voters, a lot of voters still don't understand what's at stake. They don't understand the culture war. Um, and what the next stage, I think, is for politicians to start to connect the cultural issues, which many voters still don't understand, with concrete issues like the border, crime, education outcomes, for example, health even, um, because they're all affected. Right. If you have a taboo around what you can talk about. If you say, well, we're going to deport people and we're going to have a conversation about securing the border and you're accused of being racist. So that is essentially uh, woke shutting down a debate over the border. So if you don't have free speech and you don't, you can't actually have a debate over immigration or crime or separating uh, pupils who are misbehaving in class so that you can improve educational standards, uh, then you're not going to actually be able to achieve you know, a secure border, lower crime, better educational standards, and so on. So I think politicians need to start to kind of say, look, if you care about any of these issues, you've got to care about the culture war. It's not some little sideshow happening on campus. You really have to understand this is central to your concerns. So I, I think that's really where politicians need to go. The other part of this is to use more vivid images and even buzzwords. You know, Chris Rufo with using a term like critical race theory to encompass a whole set of concerns people have about, uh, you know, divisive rhetoric in class. Similarly, using, uh, you know, a picture, it can often be worth a thousand words. In Britain, where I am, you know, in Scotland, they had a male rapist with tattoos who was being sent into a women's prison. That Once that splashed onto the news, uh, newspapers, you know, that was the end of the policy of letting those people in, letting biological males into women's prison. Prior to that, it had been all too abstract for a lot of voters. They didn't care. And again, that points out the need to make it real. So, for example, if somebody says, you know, inclusion, um, well, th the response to that is to flip it on its side, say, well, inclusion means suppressing free speech. You know, equity. Well, equity means discriminating against whites, Asians and males. Um, that kind of immediate a way of making this concrete, I think is very important, just so most people and the average voters get this, because ultimately the only way this gets solved is 
when voters say we care about this, uh, we we are going to hold our representatives to account if they don't actually do anything about this, which has been the pattern uh, between elections. The way we hold them to account, for example, on gun control or 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 pro life, on those issues, there are established lobbies that will hold. Uh, congressman to account. But when it comes to affirmative action, when it comes to indoctrination in schools, there's less of that. And, and as long as that's weak, then these issues are not going to get the same traction. He is Eric Kaufman. He's a professor of politics at the University of Buckingham. The book that we've been discussing, The Third Awakening, a 12-point pan, a 12-point plan for rolling back progressive extremism. Professor Kaufman, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Dan. Thanks very much. Thank you. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And please leave a comment in the comment section. We'd love to hear your thoughts.